Hello, this is Professor Ryan Paul, and this is the first of a series of short lectures with some basic tips on how to write about literature. When thinking about what it is that you do when you're writing about literature, we can, for the purposes of discussion, divide it into two basic tasks. These are not really separate, but for the purposes of discussion it helps to talk about these two steps as separate functions, separate activities. So the foundation of all literary reading, of all literary analysis, is what we call close reading, where you're not just reading for information, but it's the rigorous examination of a text, where you're focusing on the significant details the patterns, the structure, etc. And so you're looking to analyze the effects of the individual elements. So it's a real detail-oriented reading. And on the other side, you do what's called interpretation. That is where you're rendering the meaning that you've discovered through the process of close reading. You're putting that into words, into clear, explicit language that explains how the different parts of the text work together to create meaning. Another way to put this is to say that literary criticism combines two tasks. Uh, analysis, which is when you differentiate between the elements or components of a whole. You're breaking down a, something that appears as one whole object into its parts. And you're doing so in order to understand the structure, the operation, and the nature of the whole. You're looking at how the parts work together in order to understand the whole. And you're also doing what we call synthesis or synthesizing, where you're constructing a new whole from the combination of elements, a new text. So you're revealing the meaning behind the text. So in analysis, you break it down to see what all the components are and how they work. Synthesis, you're then showing how they add up to some new meaning, some unspoken meaning that goes beyond the literal level of the text. Now, when we're interpreting literature, we're always looking to communicate what the literature means. But what does meaning mean? That is, when we're saying, when we're looking for the meaning of a literary text, what is it that we're looking for? Well, let's examine the verb and noun for a second. Let's examine the word meaning and look at some of the definitions. When used as a verb, to mean it can be to intend or plan something to refer to something, to signify or convey some significance, to represent some idea or other thing. And the noun meaning suggests or is defined as the significance, purpose, or underlying truth of something, the definition or sense of something, the knowledge or understanding of something. So these are all different ideas about what meaning actually is. It has to do with significance, something that's not there in the thing, but that is suggested by the thing, that is beneath or beyond the thing, but is the truth of the thing. So when we say this means that, X means Y, what exactly are we saying? What's the process that goes on in meaning? Well, let's look at a simple example. TGIF means, thank God it's Friday. We all know that saying. We all know that expression. How is it that we get from TGIF to, thank God it's Friday? Well, it's very simple in, in operation here. One thing means the other because one letter stands in for or represents a word, a word that starts with that same letter. So TGIF means, thank God it's Friday, in a very simple way. On the other hand, let's take that statement, thank God it's Friday. What does that mean? Well, thank God it's Friday means, and there's a number of different ways we could phrase this, Friday is the end of the work week, and I am thankful that my work is at an end and that I'll be able to rest for the weekend, so I'm happy that it's Friday because blah, 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 right? We can go on. There's a number of different ways we might explain what it is that this means, all these ideas. How is it, though, that thank God it's Friday suggests all these ideas? much more complex ideas. It's clearly not in the same way as the first example. It's not a simple sense of each letter standing in for another word. Well, instead, it's a much more complex process where the words and the structure that they're in represent or evoke certain familiar social and cultural concepts and contexts. They 
evoke to us, they remind us of things that we understand, similar situations, similar emotions, feelings, etc. And through those, we're able to understand this meaning, what's intended, what's communicated beyond the literal statement, thank God it's Friday. So when we're looking for the meaning of a literary text, we're really looking at a very complex and mysterious process that can work in a number of different ways. And this brings us to the, the challenge and the paradox of meaning, of trying to interpret any literary text. We might ask ourselves the question, do you mean what you say? Do we always mean what we say when we speak? Because, as we've seen, language always leads to more language, words to more words. If you if there's a word that you don't understand, a sentence that you don't understand, the way to understand it is to put it in different words, to learn what the words that are in that sentence mean by comparing them or connecting them with words that you already know. So when a literary text says one thing, A, the words that are there, it means another thing, B, words that are not there. Yet we cannot reach the meaning of the text without going through the message. We can't reach the meaning B without understanding the literal words that are on the text because message A creates and shapes meaning B, yet meaning B gives sense and purpose to message A. So they're inextricably related to one another. So we get to this ultimate paradox in a sense that A equals B, that is the text equals the meaning, yet the message of the text is different. So it does not equal the meaning because the meaning is of course going to be in different words. Literary texts then create meaning rather than possess meaning. The words create through their interpretation, through the process of being read, they create another set of meanings. And what we do as literary critics when you're reading and writing about literature is you're revealing the, the meaning that is produced and you're showing the process of its creation. How is it that message A takes us to meaning B? How does this body of words evoke another complex, another system of meanings? And how is it that we get from A to B? So to go back to the earlier statements, the earlier ideas, we analyze the text, break it down into its component parts in order to interpret it, in order to render in our own language the ideas that are created by that text. And if we want to divide literature or divide a literary text into its basic elements, one way to do so is to think about its form and its content. And just like message and meaning, these two things are intimately connected and can't really be separated from one another. When we talk about form, we, we are talking about formal features, the things that give form or shape to the text, the literary devices that structure and organize the words, the ideas of the text. So this could be plot, figurative language like metaphor and simile, characters, uh, line links, rhyme, uh, all sorts of things like this, chapter breaks, however the, the, the text is literally structured, how the words are put together on the page, what are the organizing features. And then the content of the text is the words themselves, the ideas that are created by the words. And again, these two things cannot really be separated because form provides structure through which the content is expressed. Without a form, we can't express any content. Without the words being put in some sort of meaningful order and rules that we can follow or break about how to put words in the specific order, then we can't express any meaning through those words. And at the same time, the content gives meaning and purpose to the form. You can't have a form without some matter in it. You can't have a sentence without words, without ideas that it's trying to express. So what we're looking at then in literature, if we're trying to get from message A to meaning B, we're also trying to explain how it is that the form and the content go together. How is it that the way the text is structured, the way that it's built, gives expression to the ideas in the words themselves or the the word the ideas that are suggested by the words and their combinations 
Now, of course, that's not all that goes into interpreting a text. There are various extra literary components or things that are quote unquote outside the text, although there's an argument to be made that these things are, in fact, an essential part of it as well. But at least when we learn are first learning how to interpret literature, we generally try to focus, even though it is an artificial exercise, on the text itself, the literary components that I discussed in the last slide. But some other elements that we can bring in include, for example, the author's biography that can be brought in in various ways to help understand what's being expressed. Cultural and historical contexts, which are extremely important to understand that in a specific period, in a specific place, something, some words might have had uh, a meaning or uh, impression or resonances that they don't have today. And, of course, the reader's own experiences and attitudes, what we bring to the text, what we think, what we expect and know, these affect the meaning of a text. And these are all things that, as you get more sophisticated at reading the language and the structure, you start to understand how these are part of it as well. But again, often in the early stages of reading literary texts, we leave these things to the side as much as possible. So let's review. The most important concept that I want to get across in this first lecture on writing about literature is that the text itself is the thing. You want to focus on what is said on the page. What are the words that are there? Any ideas that you have, any interpretations that you come up with must be tied to the text, to the words that are on the page. So you always have to go back to that as your source and origin of meaning and the object of your analysis. And meaning is produced, not pre-existing. Meaning changes depending on who's reading, when and where a text is being read, how the language is organized, what specific words are there. So meaning is something that's always produced through the process of reading. And the text means what it says, but it also does not mean what it says. So there's the literal words on the page, which we can understand to have a certain set of meanings, but those words take us to other meanings, other contexts, other ideas. So we have, again, message A and meaning B. And the interconnection of form and content, just as the words themselves lead us to some meaning that is not stated in the language of the text, the form, the way the text is structured, is inextricable from its content, from the ideas that it expresses. These things, we can't have form without content, and we can't have content without form. So just a final thought. The particular meaning of any literary text, or any non-literary text, relies on the specific language it uses to create that meaning. So this means that the meaning cannot be paraphrased or detached from the words used to create it. No matter how similar two stories might be, they are always going to mean something different because the particular words they use, the particular language that they use, the way those words are structured and ordered is going to be different. So there's no two texts that have the same meaning. And again, it can't be paraphrased. In order to reach the meaning, we must go through the message. And in fact, without the message, we couldn't have the meaning. It wouldn't mean anything to us if we didn't have it told to us in this particular way that the text does.